Well, everybody, we got our special guest back again to the show, an NFL All-Pro player, broadcaster, author of Never Shut Up, and founder and CEO of ProjectTransition.org, Marcellus Wiley. Welcome back to the show. Oh, feels good to be back here, man. I'm ready for this. I know you got some spice today. Let's go. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So the backstory is Marcellus is up early as hell this morning. I don't know how he's even able to smile, to be quite honest with you. I don't even know how he's able to smile this early in the morning. But we're going we to get it. Uh, we're we going to get it done. Uh, I got here a lot today. of kids, so, Charles. I got more kids than fingers. <laughs> more kids than fingers. So let's do it. <laughs> I'm up. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So. There's the big story, <laughs> excuse me, I'm sure you've heard of it, featuring uh, Brian Windhorse of ESPN. Let me give you the quick back, back story. Basically, Allen Iverson went on Shaq's podcast, the big podcast. He's there. They're talking about a bunch of things. Then Shaq asks Allen Iverson, hey, given that the way the game is played today, how wide open it is, how many points a game do you think you could score today? Mm. AI says, I think I can get above 40 points per game. So he says that him and Shaq say, oh, you think so? Okay, great. Then they bring those topics to ESPN, to Tim Legler and Brian Windhorst. Brian Windhorst then gets a hold of those topics, gets a hold of the topic, and essentially says that there's no way in hell, no way in hell that Allen Iverson would even be given an opportunity to take as many shots. No way in hell he's doing it. Then NBA players come out, and they go on the post on Twitter. Carmelo Anthony says they will always find a way to discredit. Matt Barnes says, shaking my head, these hot takes for attention are getting ridiculous. Ross Strickland says, please understand the difference between basketball knowledge and entertainment. Why are we giving so much time to non-basketball people? And Kevin Durant <laughs> said, just delete this post, please. He put that under the post. So Marcellus, <laughs> yeah. what is your reaction to all of the flack that Brian Winhorst is getting for his comments on Allen Iverson? Oh, man, I heard those comments from Brian, and he knew the flack was coming because if you listen to him and all the qualifiers he gave, like, look, I love Allen Iverson. Look, Allen Iverson was amazing. Look, and you knew the big butt statement. I'm talking about, like, Sir Mix-a-Lot, big butt statement was coming out, and he said, but? And I was like, don't do it. But... Don't do it. You, you, you know, we got to give respect to somebody who does cross that line and actually at least try mm. to support it with an argument. So I kind of gave him a salute in that respect. <laughs> Even if the argument is wrong, you still got to salute <laughs> the fact that he didn't just throw a hot take and say, all right, back to you, Tim Legler. Like, he went through it. <laughs> what he said was interesting. Now, his violation was he stabbed the NBA culture right in his heart. Don't mess with Allen Ooh. Iverson. Like That's Messiah. Like wow. People love wow. Allen Iverson. Because you got to remember back in the day when he played, he had so much more on his back than just going out there and performing. Like He was a part of you know the whole dress code. Remember they made that change? Right. They were talking about all the athletes acting like rappers. And then they were talking about who's individual versus <clears throat> team versus part of the organization. Like Allen Iverson was standing up on principle. He was standing up on business. So everyone reveres Allen Iverson, those former players especially. Yes. So he said something that was interesting, and people don't want to hear it, but he was like, yo, he wasn't the most efficient scorer. And in today's NBA, if you're not efficient and shooting threes, coach is going to give you a short leash. And I think that was the crux of his argument, which is like, yeah, like if you're not gunning up threes right now, which Allen Iverson would have been able to do because it would have been a different NBA for Allen Iverson. Same NBA, thing with Larry Bird. Sure. People talk about how Larry Bird was the best three-point shooter in the world until Steph Curry. And Larry Bird was taking like three threes. Like three. <laughs> and we talk about, oh, he's the greatest yeah, all time. He wasn't taking a lot. He right. Lot. So I, th I think that I laugh at us. I laugh at men. I laugh at everybody in sports media because we are on a mission to ask questions that can't be proven. Like we're on a mission to say, okay, mm. prove something that can't be proven. I don't know what the hell <laughs> Allen Iverson gonna do right now, but Allen Iverson <laughs> thinks he can do it, and I'm not the one to bet against Mr. Basketball like that. So Winhurst knew he was stepping in it, and he just was like, hey, bring it on. You know, it's funny you said that. They brought up that topic yesterday on ESPN, and during this time, it was Brian Winhorst was still there. You had Kendrick Perkins, and you had Stephen A. Smith. Kendrick Perkins almost lost his damn mind. When Brian Winners was talking, 
Kendrick Perkins was literally like this. He had his head down. You know how Kendrick would be like this? And he'd be huffing and puffing. He was like totally uh, dejected when he said that. And Kendrick's point was, I understand that you're looking at the analytics, yeah. but I'm also looking at the eye test and the skill set that this guy had at six foot, 165 pounds, Sick. scoring 33 a game, which is incredible. And he, you're telling me if this guy could do it then, where you could actually touch people, there was no freedom of movement. And Brian Winnos was like, no, the analytics don't say that. He gets, I'm sick of your analytics. So I did some research. <laughs> Okay. I, I did some research and I found out Russell Westbrook, when he was winning MVPs, was just about as efficient as AI. Mm. Damian Lillard this season is shooting about 42, 43% from the field. Trey Young is shooting about 42% from the field. So I think maybe that's the reason why some of those NBA guys push back, or maybe they just saw it as a reason to take a shot at another journalist. <laughs> Who knows? Nah, but but the, to your point, yeah, you can be that inefficient in certain situations. And to, I guess, Brian's point is like, yeah, none of them dudes are scoring 40. Like, you know, so you just, and I understand he's just going to get at a higher usage rate. And that's what Tim Legler was saying. It's like, look. Yeah, yeah. Y'all got to understand it's not just efficiency. It's when you show that level of efficiency, is coach going to keep letting you do it? And uh, are your teammates going to keep letting you do it? Like, mm, ah, mm, like mm, to get mm, to 40. Mm, um, it's not really I, – I, <coughs> the verdict is the players are right because what, what I don't think Brian understands is when you're an athlete in your era, you are only learning from what you've seen and what you can do. Like you're trying to imagine a new reality and you're trying to use that based on what you've seen from other players. And those are the ones that raised you into it. So I'll give you a great example. When I played DN in the NFL, everyone was telling me B64 280. I was like, look, I could work on the 280 part, but the 6'4 is on my mama and daddy. I can't determine my height. But they were like, the right, perfect right. DN is 6'4, 280. He could play the run and play the pass. So literally, when I'm walking around at 255, guess what I did? I bulked up. I forced myself to live up to some standard. Well, mm. Allen Iverson in that day, Larry Bird in his day, they were forcing themselves to live up to some standard and then exceeded it. So Larry Bird's like, I'm going to shoot threes. I'm going to shoot three of them now. Steph Curry said, I'm going to shoot threes. I'm going to shoot six of them, seven of them. Like, yeah, yeah. everybody is going to adjust to what's around them. And I don't think Windhorse is respecting that Allen Iverson would have did the same as well. Hmm. I want to I wanna piggyback off of that. Do you think that there's still this animosity that, not animal, but like, uh, maybe not anger, but maybe aggravation that some players feel when you hear people that didn't play talking about your sport. Maybe it happened to you when you were playing in the NFL. Is this something that you felt listening to people talk about or critique you and your peers? And is this something that you heard guys in the locker room talk about? Like, why is he even talking? Like, did you, <laughs> did you get any of that when you were playing? Hell yeah. And did you I feel got, it? Hell yeah. I still got it. And I think we all got it. Like, Nobody likes somebody who ain't talking about somebody who is, right? So a girl walk in class and she ugly and she talking about, oh, she thinks she cute and she is cute. Nobody want to hear your ass tell us that she ain't fine. Uh, you talking to somebody who's like, oh man, oh man, man, your podcast is whack and weak and all that stuff. And you're like, where yours at? Like, you talking about me? What about yours? And you, it's nothing worse, man. And then if it goes levels. It's somebody who didn't do it talking about somebody who did. Then it's, we both did it, but you didn't do it like I did it. So now, what you talking about? Like, we we play this game in every single facet of life, but athletics is different because it's so objective. Like, there's a scoreboard, and I beat you, and everyone saw mm. it. So we always feel like there's no argument. And then somebody literally who didn't even step foot on the field, who is out of shape, who is just a journalist, who just got on a wrinkled suit, is trying to come at you? You're like, dog, I don't even know what to say to your ass. So that's where we are right now with this argument. Yeah, I think I think there was a lot of that. There were a lot of comments for some athletes like, if you can't do push-ups and sit-ups, don't be up here. I saw a lot of that on the Instagram. And I think some of that... Uh, is playing into all of the, uh, into the reaction that he's getting. Speaking yeah. of speaking of drama at ESPN, I want to continue at ESPN. As you know, JJ Reddick uh, recently went on this rant 
on uh, ESPN First Take where he was reacting to Kevin Durant saying basically, oh, you know, uh, people give me my credit, but, you know, I don't want people to view me as that I'm not a leader, but I am a leader. So JJ now starts going back and forth with Stephen A. Smith because Stephen A. Smith said, you know, well, KD, if you weren't always cussing people out on the Internet and maybe, you, you know, you would explain the game to us and all of that, maybe we'll feel differently. JJ hears that and he blows up. Whose fault? Is it our job to explain? Isn't it? Isn't it the player's job? What do you think about how JJ Redick, um, in terms of his performance now and how he's acting on ESPN, do you enjoy watching it or do you think he's a little bit too combative all the time? Because he always seems to be angry <clears throat> for some damn reason. Yeah, um, I think it is him in persona. Like, I don't think that's really J.J. Reddick. I think pure J.J. Reddick wants to do something he's not doing. Um, so he has his podcast, mm -hmm. and he loves that, like the conversations, the sociology, the human side of athletics, what <laughs> built you up, what made you great. And that's different than what he does on ESPN. So they say anger is mm -hmm. like when you are doing something you don't like to do and that's when you're angry because you're in a position you don't want to be in but you're still there so think about him getting on first take big platform Stephen a's there all these people here and you're like yeah i don't really fully respect all y'all basketball knowledge but hey y'all got the bigger voices y'all gave me the invite the opportunity and so i think that jj goes on there knowing that he really doesn't love all of that so I'm gonna make fun of that. Now, what him making fun of it, he's still mad at it. <laughs> like he just sitting there, like mm. you can see perturbed. So he is yeah, in a pissed. he's pissed that he gotta he gotta sit there and because of all of the the fuel and all of the pump that this is gonna give him in platform, that he gotta suffer through it. So he almost is condescending. He almost is like Yes, y'all beneath me. Like, what the hell y'all talking about? Y'all don't know yes. Jack. So anything that comes out of their mouth, he's like, y'all don't know Jack. But I don't think that he's really, really sitting there loving that experience. I think he's just using that experience for what it is to get his podcast, get his brand, get his production bigger than it is. So it, it's kind of funny to see somebody allowed to make fun of what they're on. It's funny to see him clown Stephen A. Smith. It's funny to see him go at those guys. But it's not – we don't think it's so funny because we see that he's pissed. We can see that he ain't liking it. The, 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 thing, the thing I don't understand about J.J. is the following, and it's, it's two things. And Nick Wright – I want to try to pull up a, a quote that Nick Wright had of uh, – uh, excuse me, responding to what J.J. This, – this, this very thing we're talking about. J.J. Redick acts as if, like, he doesn't know where he is, where he's going to go work at, and mm -hmm. what happens at the show. Like, he goes there and acts like, oh, this is what you guys do? And I'm like, what did you think happens at ESPN? I want to read a quote from Nick Wright. He said, in response to, to J.J. Redick, I, I, I want to get your thoughts on it. He said, I totally understand folks who aren't into televised sports discussion slash debate. It's not for everyone. I will never understand someone who is incredibly wealthy ops uh, uh, into working in the space and then simply uses the platform to complain about how useless and dumb the space is. What do you think about what Nick Wright had to say in reaction to 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 JJ Reddick there? Um, I think he's he's bullseye in terms of nailing what JJ Reddick is doing. What I think Nick is either missing or doesn't want to admit to is that that's the new game. That's one of the plays of the game. One of the plays of the game is now, okay, where can I go get the most promotion? Do I have to be the most authentic as well? No. Like, there are so many different lanes now because we keep talking about how traditional TV sports media has shifted. Well, let's also talk about how the landscape of independence is creating more opportunities and more lanes to do it the way you want to. There are shows that are deep X's and O's and dark dungeons breaking down game film. And then there are shows where they just talking trash and they just watching cats play and they just making jokes and everything in between. But what Nick didn't give credit to is like what Stephen A does is not his most authentic self. Stephen A knows that he is putting character into broadcasting these players. That's why he's the biggest, because he's the most 
entertaining one that still has mm -hmm. credit, that still has validation, that people still say, yeah, I get that point. That was a good point. So Stephen A has done the best blend of it to the level of his notoriety. But that's not, watch First Take. Watch Undisputed. Y'all think people really talk like that? Act like that? Would say that to somebody else? So we already have lost what authentic is in sports TV media. So now when JJ does it to another degree or a different way, don't be mad at JJ. He just ain't doing it like Stephen A does it. But cats don't talk like that. We get it. You know it. No one talks like these people in real life, right. but that lets you know it's a production. Don't get mad that what JJ is producing. You, you, you're talking about Stephen A. Smith and the relationship with JJ. They've had some pretty nasty moments on TV. One time it got really weird. And Stephen A. Smith, I've noticed now, whenever him and JJ kind of start getting into it, he always says, like he did it after commercial break, he goes, oh, no, no, like me and JJ are friends. Me and JJ are friends. It's fine. Do you think that Stephen A. Smith is all for the mudslinging the, the the shouting, the screaming, as long as it makes money? And do you think that this is basically what this entire thing is turning into? Like a basic a shit show. Sorry to curse. <laughs> well, look, they uh -huh. got to keep the eyeballs on them anyway, anyhow, right? So you, you, we all make choices, man. And the choice that they've made is to be on that show doing it with a certain style. And that style is what? A little extra hot sauce, a little exclamation point, you know, emphasis. You you know, Ryan Clark, when he was there, uh, he started to adopt the Stephen A. Smith model, like, you know, really leaning right. into what the emphasis of stuff instead of just saying it like it is. We get it. It's okay. I know Stephen A. Smith. Stephen A. Smith is, is all, I would say, quiet, but he's certainly way more quiet off air than he is on air. Like a lot of entertainers, TV. right? Some of my friends are comedians, big time comedians. When you hang around them, you got to force words out of them. When you see them on stage, they hilarious. They crazy. They turn the switch on like football players, et cetera. So right. I think J.J. Smith, I mean, J.J. Smith, J.J. <laughs> um, <laughs> J. J. Reddick, uh, that's, a, that's an interesting person. That's going to be the next model. Uh, J.J. Reddick exactly. <laughs> really made Stephen A. Smith mad sometimes somewhere. He really did. And now yes. Stephen A. Smith is like, look. I've been through this before with Max. And, you know, Max and I had our issues. Stephen A wore his disdain for Max. He wore, I don't really yes. rock with this dude. Fuck yes. Max. Like, he wore yes. fuck yes. Max. And yes. it lasted for years. And everybody was kind of like, ah, oh, this is part of the act? No, maybe. I don't know. Oh, this is weird. And then it played itself <laughs> out. I think Stephen A. Smith, the, the smart genius of Stephen A. Smith is like, this time... I'm, he went through a Will Kane. He's like, this time, I'm going to allow it to live, even though I don't like uh, it because it is working. They're getting their highest ratings of all time, so let them right. do it. And more importantly, you can tell he in on it because he got... He has to clarify it every time. He got to say, yeah, no, nah, we still boys. Oh, no, nah, no, nah, we cool. That's right. telling himself. He reminded himself... Deal with it, because <laughs> he know damn well he don't want to deal with that stuff. We already see. He don't want to deal with it. Nah. You, it, it. you you bring up Max Kellerman, and this is a uh, Max is is uh, people are always asking me questions on the channel. Hey, what about Max? Did you hear anything about Max? Can you ask Marcella something about Max? Did Max <laughs> Kellerman eat today? I'm like, I'll ask him. I'll ask him. I'll ask him. I've been thinking about Max uh, in terms of what he used to provide to the sports space, like in, in sports media. Do you, do you think a person like Max Kellerman, the way he would analyze things, his intelligence, his his dry sense of humor, do you think a voice like Max is missed right now in sports media with the way things are just going crazy right now? Oh, absolutely missed. Um, missed and uh, also it was underappreciated when it was going down with him, especially at first take. Like he didn't get his full... <clears throat> full bouquet of flowers. Um, look, I know Max, that's like my brother from another. Everybody know that's my dog. Um, yep. No matter what. Uh, <laughs> let me just go back. I think to answer Max and uh, his space in, in sports media is to really know what happened. Uh, Max, Max is a kid from New York who grew up better than most. 
Uh, dad's a therapist. You know, they have five dollars. Um, but Max was just gravitated towards the street life and not just like, you know, some hood stuff, but like like hip hop and like the culture and stuff. You know, right. we've seen it. Right. Right. And, yeah. and it's sad because when you like that, but if you ain't black, then everybody judging you. Right. Everybody. Ah, mm-hmm. yeah. Are you really like mm-hmm. rapping? Mm-hmm. Like, you know what I'm saying? You're mm-hmm. like, dog, what the hell are you talking about? Mm-hmm. And, I, you know, I don't know if he went on a mission to prove it, but let's just say anybody who likes rap enough to become a rapper. <laughs> they might love <laughs> rap. It ain't like it ain't no front, y'all. He really a rapper. Exactly. Like, I love rap. I DJ, but I ain't no rapper. So he went all the way with it. And the funniest thing is, like, it's really a big life lesson. Like Max comes from a whole different background and backdrop than me. But when I connected with him, uh, <laughs> it was like, dog, how we got so much in common? So. I'm not alone in that. A lot of people like to watch sports media and sit back and have to think. Uh, what happened with at first take, I will say this. They didn't see the full Max because when he came in, Stephen A. Smith and him just didn't necessarily mesh, right? Stephen A. Smith wanted a whole different version of his co-host because now he got Max and he like, I done left Skip, Skip left me. And now this is my thing. Oh, it's going to go a different direction, right? New sheriff in town. Mm -hmm. And Max, Max too smart for all that. Max is different. And so Max was trying to work with him, conform, fit in, and it just didn't work. work. Um, So Max didn't really show y'all who Max is. Max is a nut. Max is hilarious. Max is funny. Even when he left Stephen A and got the other show, uh, that that ain't Max. Max needs to get something that's like your show, like something where he's just really breaking it down, talking, and ain't got to like go back and forth with some dude who ain't feeling him, right? And I think that mm-hmm. once you see that, and that's how we had it in our radio show. That's why everyone always associates him and I because of what we did. I allow people to be themselves. Right. I ain't tripping. I'm going to get mine off, and we just going to have fun. So hopefully Max gets that opportunity again because right now he's just chilling. He making big money sitting at the crib taking care of the family. So good to Max. But um, at the end of the year, we're going to see something different from Max. Um, he says he wants to come out, do something big. We're going to see what that is. Well, now, you know, we spoke about Stephen A. Smith and all of that. He recently made some comments. But I want to kind of piggyback off the Max thing in terms of the kind of black and white guy, black guy, white guy. Stephen A. Smith basically says something as it pertains to Pat McAfee. He mm. said, essentially, because he, he clarified it on his show, he said that Pat McAfee is given certain uh, uh, um, passes because, number one, he's not expected to take political views and political stances on things to toe the line according to the way Disney sees things. And number two, he said that he's going to get uh, breaks because he's white that I wouldn't get because I'm a black person. When I heard that, I felt like Stephen A. Smith some t- like often plays the race card when it's not necessary. What are your thoughts about him saying that things are harder on him at ESPN because he's black and people kind of overlook things because Pat McAfee is white and no one expects him to answer the tough questions? Yeah, that's lazy. Um, That's lazy. Mm. Uh, It's really damaging to those who don't know Stephen A. Smith, those who don't have the same level of success as Stephen A. Smith. Um, I know Stephen A. Smith is trying to tell all the people, his people, uh, that I'm down for y'all. I got y'all back. Um, I'm fighting for y'all up here. And that's the dumbest thing you can do to our people. Let me tell you why, because I'm from the same, if you want to say level, uh, from the bottom, uh, growing up, there's a boogeyman out there that, that it's funny that a lot of race hustlers and a lot of successful black people want to always subscribe to. They want to tell everybody back there, no matter how successful you are, how much money you got, you're still an N word. I don't use the N word, but you're still a ninja. And yes. like, okay, so for my entire life, I'm supposed to believe that no matter what I do, no matter what I achieve, that I'm still lower or lesser than. 
Like, you know how dumb that sounds? Let me tell you why. Because mm -hmm. they want to they want to blame the system or blame like, oh, look, my, my epidermis, my complexion is just the reason that Pat McAfee gets something that I don't get. If the system is so damn rigged against Stephen A. Smith or anybody like that, then how the hell did you win in the system? And he beat question. the system. So if the system is rigged, guess who does the rigging? You. You do the rigging by how valuable you are. Now, I don't know, but Stephen A. Smith is an A++ in terms of the success grade. Why in the hell is he now acting like, oh, Pat McAfee just got more of a grade than him just because of his skin color? Or he gets a pass because of his skin color. I worked there before. Stephen A. Smith knows that there, the privileges he has, Pat McAfee didn't have when Pat McAfee wasn't that valuable, when Pat McAfee wasn't there. They told Pat McAfee he couldn't even work there. The skin color mm. didn't even get him an interview. <laughs> the skin color didn't even get him on one show. But then when he goes out there and builds up something bigger than everybody else, including Stephen A. Smith, that's why Stephen A. Smith mm -hmm. is doing it this way now. Like, I get it. I'm in the game, too. And they, is Stephen A. got me beat. And it ain't because of his skin color. It's because he's more valuable to the sports media landscape. And guess what? If that's true, guess what, Stephen A.? Pat McAfee got you beat because of the value. I play football, dog. On football teams, you know who the man is? The best player. If you go to Baltimore, you think Lamar Jackson ain't getting passes that Justin Tucker ain't getting? Like Justin Tucker, like, oh, I wish I was Lamar Jackson. Like, he getting his love, but he ain't getting no more love because of no skin color. I hate this. Mm. I hate this conversation to the fullest because mm. it is scaring or it is giving a phobia to so many people who try to be as successful or just half as successful as Stephen A. But he trying to play I'm down with y'all is going to actually make it worse for those people trying to ascend. So ain't no, let me just tell everybody out there because I don't have my level of success. Ain't no boogeyman, y'all. Y'all can let it go. Hmm. Ain't no saviors hmm. and ain't no boogeyman. So anybody who tells you that, they lying. And if they, if you think they tell the truth, ask they ask, how the hell you get up there then? They ain't going to say mm -hmm. much then. So mm -hmm. I, I just don't like race hustlers because I'm from the race. <laughs> and to win the race, you can't act like somebody else is trying to trip you up. That's life. Everybody has these same obstacles. So get back on point with Pat McAfee. Pat McAfee is just more valuable to, ES, to ESPN right now than Stephen A. Smith because, not because his show is better, it's because he has leverage. He has the leverage of, I can go back to 125 yes. million plus. Yes. <laughs> so what y'all say? What'd you say? Yes. And then Stephen yes. A. Smith is building something so he can say, well, oh, I can go and do that. But right now, Stephen A. Smith is approaching free agency to build up something in option that Pat McAfee already got. That ain't race-based, y'all. That's just how the game went. We talk about race. I don't talk about it much on, yeah. on my channel because I try not to get too much into politics. However, I saw, I remember a segment with you and Emmanuel Acho back on, I think it was Speak for Yourself. And you guys were talking about race. I think it was something pertaining to some comments that LeBron made about maybe the time they painted his house, something like that. I know there was a discussion with Jason Willock and all of that. I've noticed, as someone that talks about ESPN, that a lot of people are turned off by ESPN, even though they still somehow get all of these people to watch their shows, although they're losing subscriptions. I don't know how it all works. <laughs> but a lot of people are started to get turned off by ESPN because they feel like they're always making everything about race and they try to do it a lot. And in the case of Stephen A. Smith, he just did it again with Pat McAfee. Do you think that that is something that is deliberate at ESPN and it's something that they look for in people when they hire them? Or it's just that they just somehow end up keep hiring people that always find a way to talk about this kind of stuff. Um, I think it's just, that's what occurs. Um, I don't think that they're okay. intentional in their hiring practices with that. I don't. Um, why? Because you can see that there's a cultural pressure that's greater than ESPN uh, from our American landscape 
our American politics that if you're a liberal, progressive, speak and speak loudly about it. If you're conservative, hide, go in a corner and, you know, mm. don't talk loud about it. Be real about it. We know how this game goes, unless yes. you're in protected areas. Like if you're in the South, right. okay, you can speak a little louder conservative. But, uh, you know, corporate media, oh, it's just liberal. It's progressive. I know it. I get it. I see those pressures. So the reason people are upset at ESPN because of all of the race baiting is not because it's just a race conversation. It's because it's not a balanced conversation. It's not a two-way street. It's mm-hmm. when Will Cain was there, they had some conservative ideas coming yeah. out, but mo- it's always like nine on one. <laughs> it's like, we got 10 people up here and nine on one. There's nine liberal progressives or just silence. Like, and that's complicity too. It's like somebody who just like, mm-hmm, not disagreeing. Mm-hmm. So Acho and I, I think what people liked about what we were doing uh, was I would balance the conversation off two ways. One, through my conservative principles that I do have, but two, I can be a contrarian. I can argue the other side. Like, just because for the sake of argument, I can argue the other side. Because what's the point? You You do know that no matter what side you want, there's almost an equal amount of people on the other side. So why not give a balanced conversation? So um, it's just funny to watch that all of this is happening and they still haven't corrected it. Like they still haven't balanced it out yet. Like now go intentional and hire somebody conservative that is entertaining, that knows sports, that just can balance out the conversation. So maybe that's JJ Reddick in disguise. Maybe JJ is up there like you guys. Maybe that's it, but you can't get into a race conversation with the white person on, on ESPN because you're going to box them in. If they say anything other than what Stephen A. Smith says, or I'm down for the people, they're racist. And that's why they mm-hmm. don't have anybody opposing them. And that's just how the game goes. Hmm. It's, in- it's interesting you're saying that about, you know, conser- I, 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 will, I will tend to agree with the, the, the conservative thing. I'll, I'll, I'll speak more from a standpoint of <clears throat> being, for instance, a Christian, like I'm a Christian yeah, and yeah. I've noticed that uh, certain Christian values, ideologies have been under attack for quite some time. And sometimes I look at what's happening in the States and I look like you turn on the soup, you see all this. I'm like, how, where, like how, when did all of this start happening? I noticed mm-hmm. that, if you have a Christian conservative view, not saying I'm a conservative, I'm not picking sides. I'm just saying that from that standpoint, I noticed that there's been this attack uh, on that for whatever reason. I don't know why. Uh, and I think it's getting weird uh, at this point, uh, in the, the way the world is going when it comes to that. I don't know why. It's just, it's getting a little freaky. <laughs> <to me. laughs> yeah, it's, it's, freaky. It's, it, it, look, it, let's be real. It's some weirdos with power. And look, yes, I, 100%. There are, our families are breaking down. Like the nuclear family, whatever we thought family was, it's not the same now as it was then. Like people are really raising their hand and proud to just have a baby somewhere and then be like, okay, that's my kid, but I'm not even thinking about their mama. And worse, I hate their mama. And then worse, acting like they were a full-time dad or mom. I'm like, dog, if you're not there, if you're not available, then guess what? That's not the same. So we used to be raised like that. So I always tell people, hey, look, if you don't want to raise your kids, the streets will do it gladly. And so a lot of people yeah. are raised in weird environments, different environments. So that doesn't mean you can't become successful. Doesn't mean you can't become powerful. I know some people with bad backgrounds that actually have achieved, but eh, Hurt people hurt people. <laughs> and when you get that power and you come from some pain, oh, that that pain going to come through your power. And now people are just yeah. like, look, who cares about family? Who cares about these right. values? Who cares about like, because they didn't have it taught to them that way. So mm-hmm. um, it's just a lot. I know, I know people who flex. I know people who really flex politically um, through wealth. And it's crazy because... It influences so many. So that's why I'm not attacking Stephen A. Smith. I only talk sure. about the, I talk about the act and he's the actor. I, I like Stephen A. Smith as a person. I don't like some of the stuff he does. I hate the race baiting. And so the reason why it's so damaging is because 
people actually look up to Stephen A. Smith and his words right. have power. And then imagine you don't know any better. And that's help raising you. That's help guiding you. Those crazy damaging words or these crazy damaging values that we are now being forced upon. So forced upon us. So I'm with you, Charles. I just sit there. That's why in part I'm over here doing what I do and I'm going to do it my way. And people are going to be like, ah, well, you can do it a different way and be more popular. I was like, yeah, you have fun with that. Now, uh, to, before we, before we finish with ESPN, um, I'm sure you heard the story about Ryan Clark, <clears throat> who I guess his contract is coming up and he's looking to get a new contract. And he did like a, like a, I want not a movie, but like a, a short video of, <laughs> did you say a movie? Um, <laughs> I'm like I don't know what it, I I don't know what to call maybe a commercial. Let me say a commercial. God he dang. did a commercial where he was basically saying, you know, I'm worth this, I'm worth that. I believe I was this. I believe I was that. Uh, I guess the I don't know. In terms of a bargaining tool, because I know you've mm. negotiated many contracts before. Mm -hmm. What do you think about that style of playing hardball and negotiating? And ultimately, do you think it's going to work in terms of him and ESPN in in, her, in terms of him getting what he wants ultimately? Well, I think the answer is no, it's not going to work. Or at least he doesn't have full belief it's going to work. That's why he did the movie, as you said, whatever. Like, oh. I, like, 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 I've been through contracts where I had to turn my phone off because they blowing me up. Come on, Wiley. Come on, Wiley. You know, when hmm. I played in the league, like my big deal. Like, they, they say at 12.01, you can have your first call with teams. At 12.01, okay. I had eight, I had like eight calls coming in and the voicemails from my agent. He was like, just, like, they all, like at 12.01. But I've also been the guy at 12.01, silence. You can stay asleep. Ain't nothing. Nobody calling your ass. And then a, a couple <laughs> weeks go by. Nobody calling your ass. And then a month go by. Hey, somebody sent a fax and they want to see how you're doing. You know what I mean? Like, oh, I've been wow. on both sides. So you can easily tell when somebody's struggling through negotiations. I didn't think it was the strongest move because it's telling to those who know. Those who don't know be like, oh, yeah, yeah. They ain't treating you right. They ain't valuing you. But the real is, to people who know what value look like is, you ain't got to do all that asking. You ain't got to do all that begging. They going to give it to you if they want to give it to you. If not, you better go get it yourself. Get it with your muscle. So, yourself. yeah, I, I thought that it's weird. Like, you're buying a house. You told me you're moving out to the States, right? You're coming out here. Yes. I don't know if I should yes, have told yes, the whole yes. world that, but you told no, me I, that, I, right? They know. They know. They, they okay. Know, they know. <laughs> okay. So, you're selling your house in Africa, right? And then yes. you don't get what you want from it, from you, right? You put it up for a million and it's sold for 700000 I don't want to see your movie talking about this house was worth a million uh, and they don't want to pay a million. Uh, and, then uh, the house was a million. Uh, and then everybody out there dancing talking about, we should have got a million. Uh, <laughs> these dudes are frauds, man. These dudes, be, these dudes be faking people out. These are the fake moves that y'all be buying. Like, y'all, I was watching that video with Ryan Clark and look, Full disclosure, I like Ryan Clark. <laughs> Ryan Clark does not like me. I'm just telling the world. People know this. Okay. I've told my whole He probably don't like me now, but I just, oh, I'm sorry. Man. I don't want no beef. Want and no the beef, only reason right? I don't like him because he race baits. Uh, that's the only time I don't like Ryan Clark. Oh. I'm like, you race baiting. Stop oh, race baiting. God. And it didn't pay off. Like, so anyway, Ryan is literally going around saying, they didn't want to buy my house for a million. And we supposed to be like, what, what are we supposed to do with that? Like, all right, go. You got the pivot. You got inside the NFL. You can still take what they offering. They're still offering him an amount. I Pumped get it. Yes. I've been through that. I've been through that. But, dog, we do not need to hear the Hallmark card about uh, huh. they're not valuing me. Huh. Like, dog, that's on you. That ain't nobody else. And then huh. Stephen A. Smith probably hear that and be like, see, it's because you're black. It's, man, shut up. <laughs> this, ain't no boogeyman. They pay your ass, Stephen A. Like, Stephen A ain't got to worry about no, oh, they don't even want to pay me a million. Like, y'all got to stop, man. People people out here, I'm tired of the games. I am tired of oh these my games, God. man. People stop oh playing. Oh, my God. Bro, Marcel, this, this was one of this 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 one of the funniest shows we doing. Okay, I want to I want to switch gears uh, real quick to just get into the NBA quickly. Uh, as you saw, <coughs> or maybe you're unaware, excuse me, the Clippers recently played against the Oklahoma City Thunder, and they swiftly whooped our behinds. Like it mm. was swift, and it was it was. I was like, man, these guys are good. 
and yeah. SGA played really well. Like, I was like, this is the first game I, I actually w- sat down and watched them play. Mm-hmm. Um, what do you think about SGA in the year he's having, <coughs> excuse me, in terms of his MVP case? And how much of a threat do you see the Oklahoma City Thunder as in the West? Yeah, legit threat. And I know you're a Clipper fan like myself. So I went to the OKC <clears> game. <throat> Not this one, but the one before, and we beat them. So, yeah, yeah. So, like, look, it's going to be a balance, and it's going to be a balance battle between us two because, one, we're familiar with SGA, and he is familiar with us. Uh, I remember when they traded him away, you know, obviously Paul George, we had to get it, pair him up with Kawhi, et cetera, going back a few years. And that was the most regret our organization ever had internally about making a move. Like they literally, I think even at the press conference, they said, we don't want to do this. <laughs> we know what's really? coming. Yeah, because they knew what they had in him and they knew what they were sending away. But at that time, the Clippers were in a like wow. win now mode because we got a mode. superstar who needs another superstar, not another young budding star, not another guy yeah. who's going to groom it to that. Like, you know, we, we got to go get this right now. We got Kawhi. We got to get PG. We got to do this. We got to match them together. And that was based on the demand. So they just knew what they were giving up. And now it's coming back for the reckoning. <laughs> like SGA is yeah, a Yeah, for real, man. He's he, a he, problem. Oh, he all levels too. He not just what we see on the court, but, you know, going to the game and just watching his mannerisms and just watching how he – he works with others and how the coaches and how he listens, but he also commands. He here to stay. And we're going to have problems dealing with him. I think what we yep. can do against OKC is simple. We we can beat them uh, deaf by a thousand paper cuts. Uh, we still have high level, more than just SGA, more than just James Hart, made it more than just Kawhi, more than just PG. We got the depth that I think will yes. take us past them. Norman, I think our depth will get them. Norman Powell coming off the bench from Norman Westbrook, Powell, yeah. et cetera. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what's going to win it for us. You mentioned something about, uh, to, before we finish with the Clippers, you mentioned something about at the time when Kawhi was coming to the team, they wanted to win first now, uh, and they had to make a decision because Kawhi is like, I don't have time to be waiting for somebody to develop. As a, as a season ticket holder, as somebody that lives in LA, as somebody that attends the games, what is the general sentiment about Kawhi Leonard in the Clippers organization, although he's playing very well this year. How do they feel about him? Do they feel like, man, we messed up here? Or they're like, if only we could just have a season with everybody healthy and we'll see what we got. What do you think is the general sentiment about Kawhi Leonard in the Clippers organization? I think they're happy. Um, I don't think they're fully satisfied because Kawhi hasn't been available with PG when it mattered most. And then we could really have a true judgment of what this team is. Um, They're super excited about this year um, in terms of them staying healthy. But we've been here before, like tremendous regular season. This one feels special. This one feels unique, but we've been here before. Clippers look good. Clippers look good. And then something happens. Clippers going Clipper. You know what they say, you know. It's some kind of like whatever's happening with the Dallas Cowboys is kind of happening with the Clippers, except they have all that past success that we don't have. So we're always Mm. just holding our breath. Stay healthy. Stay together. Stay clean. And and so we're here again. And uh, we got to see something, though. So Kawhi got his extension. So that proves how much they believe in him. But they're like, dog, I love you to death. Just be there when we hmm. need you most. Just just you, Paul, just this crew. Yeah. Stay together, yeah, yeah. stay healthy, and let's just finish this thing. And they got the new arena next year, obviously, to land yeah. softly in. Uh, but this is great excitement building up to that next that next stop, which is that new arena. Two quick questions on, on that, and, and I'll close out. I watched the game yesterday. To piggyback on what you said, I watched the game between them and the, and the, and the, and the Grizzlies. And I, I was watching Kawhi. He would get hit a few times. I'm like, man, I hope he's okay. I hope uh, I hope nothing happened. Like, so I, I agree with you when they're like everybody just holding their breath. Number two, just out of general curiosity, I've never been a season ticket holder. Now they're getting the new arena. You're a season ticket holder now. Are they going to bump the prices on you? Oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. I'm gonna cut you off. Hell yeah. What? And I, I, I got. It's a different rate. My... What? Wow. It, it... It's a different world, <laughs> <laughs> different rate. I'm like, hey, look, I'm not, they're almost sold out. Uh, I just got a text 
yesterday for my guy, my, my, my coordinator, Grant. And he's like, oh, we almost sold out. What you going to do, Wally? And I'm like, I'm looking at my TV. I'm looking at my TV like, you better work next year because, Devin, I ain't about to spend. I got, I got three tuitions and I got to play that much. Because, I, you know, I go to the games right now. I love my seat. But what I, my seat, the equivalent of it next year is 2, 3X. And I'm like, ah. Wow. I, but it's, I can't lie. It's worth it if you there. But it ain't worth it when you're not there and you got to write the check to get there. And I'm like, damn right, it. Right, I know right, it's right, worth right, it when right. I'm there, but I'm not. I, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm like, I don't wow, know about right. that. But um, it's going to be insane. The new arena is insane. Steve Ballmer is the best owner. Um, yeah. Not because he's of team it. success. He just spent his money. He's just like, I got more money than yeah. all these owners and I'm going to spend it. Uh, he's killing yeah. it, man. So I wish I could. If he gave me $5, maybe I could make it. Maybe I could get there. <laughs> Okay, my final question to get you out of here is uh, recently Jason Tatum said that he views himself as the best player in the world. And I don't think I've ever asked you this question. When you look at the landscape, you look at Nikola Jokic, you look at Luka, you look at Jason Tatum, you look at Giannis, you look at Embiid, although he's injured, you look at Kawhi, all of these guys. In your mind, who is the best player in the world today? Man. I would have said without you leading me with a Jason Tatum conversation, it would have been Jokic. I think he's put the most together. He's a like monster. Oh God, Lord. Like it, it, I almost appreciate someone who does it, and you didn't see it coming more than somebody you saw coming. Like we were talking about Allen mm -hmm. Iverson before. You're like, yeah. I don't see that coming. Six one. Oh God, Lord. And then you're like, Wow. When you see Jokic <laughs> or even Luca is in the conversation, but not number two, but Luca, you're like, and then you watch him play, you're like, the skills jump off the screen. Uh, they're yeah, fundamentals. Crazy. They ain't even rising up. They, they, they're just, they're just yeah, so crazy. crafty. They just mastered the game of basketball and exude intelligence. Like, like right, those yeah. two. When I watch Jason Tatum, I'm like, there's no reason he's not the best player in the world. But mm, okay. I don't have all the argument that he is the best player in the world. I've seen him right. on the final stage. I'm like, okay. Get over that hump, but we're right there. Uh, watch him in the regular season. He's always a boss. I just think he's a perfect package. It's just waiting for that ribbon, that bow on top. We, right, we just right, not right. yet, not yet. And I think that he's in that conversation with Luca. Um, he's just a master of the craft, but he also has a skill set uh, that is even grander than some of the others because he got he's athletic. He's just a high rise. Yes. He can do it all. Um, that's the cop. You know what it is. And, and being real, like if we really want to be real, and this is not the Homer in me, all things equal. If everyone could stay healthy and play the same amount, you know, basically it would be Kawhi. Kawhi, cause yeah. Kawhi is a two way yeah. player. Kawhi yeah. not injured. Kawhi is Kawhi so good that he doesn't even play a ton back in the, the last few years. And he's still, everyone says this, he's top five when healthy. Yeah. yeah, yeah. He's top five. But top five Absolutely. when healthy. Now, that's when healthy. That means, imagine if he stays healthy and he can build on that and keep getting stronger, keep getting the reps, et cetera, no load management, et cetera. Kawhi would be the best player if he could just stay out there for, for the full course. But I give it to Jokic right now. He's a monster. I, I'm, I'm, I'm siding with you. I think it, the way I always look at it with, it, with Kawhi is if, if I'm going into the playoffs and everybody's healthy, and they say, okay, of all of these guys, pick who you want. I'll take Kawhi over everyone. But in terms mm -hmm. of the best player, man, Nikola Jokic is a, is that he is a he that dude is something else, man. He, no, he is something. He 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 is on a that dude is he's so good. And the thing that's crazy <laughs> about him is he's not like Kobe Bryant in the off season. This dude be riding horses like racing horses, doing all kind of stuff. And he comes back <laughs> and he just like is the, and he doesn't even use athleticism, yeah. which makes you wonder like, what, what do you think about athlete? Like we talk so much about that. Like, bro, this dude, nobody can stop him. I yeah. know uh, he's, he, he, he's. Let me add this. Cause like, you're, you're right. I'm going to echo what you're saying. And, and I want people to understand how great that is. Um, Cause he understood like, whatever his background is in terms of fundamental basketball, like, now I'm talking about in the gym, what he learned is, like, the highest of highs of basketball intellect. Why? He's recognized 
the athleticism part, yeah, I wasn't blessed like that. I'm tall and big, yeah. but I wasn't, I'm not a high flyer. I'm not moving that fast, et cetera. But what he learned is the fastest thing on the court is not these players, it's that ball. So master the ball. It's funny because I coach eight-year-olds and we <clears throat> just won another championship back to back to back. Um, <laughs> we had an all-star game yesterday, Congrats. won that too. Congrats. Now let me stop. Here's Congrats. the point. I ain't, no, I ain't no Phil Jackson. I'm Phil Belichick because I coach football too. Here's the thing. Um, you look at these kids and you can just see right now why players – believe in athleticism first and only, and you can see why players don't have the same fundamentals. They chasing the guy around all day, and then they're trying to like play defense on the guy. I'm like, what do you want? Do you want the guy or do you want the ball? And they sit there and think, oh yeah, yeah. I want the ball. So, so why are ball. you chasing him? Right, it's almost like when they always teach you, uh, when someone does a move, what are you supposed to look at? Not the move, you're supposed to look at either yeah, his yeah. hips, or where is he Oops. trying to go? Oh, like, yes. stop yes, thinking yes, about yes, what yes. he's doing and think about what he's trying to get done. And Jokic yes, is yes. like that level. Like, miss me yes. with all the disguise and makeup. I know what you want. And guess what? I got what you need. <laughs> he is silly, dog. <laughs> yeah, no, he he's... He, uh, if the Clippers were to meet the Nuggets, I will be shaking in my boots if they got to go against that dude because man, he Zubat! he is that <laughs> man. He gonna Help he Zubat. gonna he gonna he gonna he gonna he gonna rotisserie fry that dude. They gonna be pouring a barbecue on his back, man. He gonna he gonna destroy Zubat. So hopefully they don't have to meet him. But anyway, uh, Marcellus, we want to thank you so much for taking time out. Uh, today, this, especially this early morning, to to join us on the show, we really appreciate it. Today was a hilarious show. I'm sure you didn't start up some drama with these comments, and I'm all here for the smoke. So um, <laughs> we're definitely we're we're, we're definitely we're definitely gonna have a lot of fun with this show, man. Thank you so much. Thank you for taking time out. We appreciate it. Thank you so much for being here today, man. Much love, big dog. We are gonna do it again. I'll talk to you soon, bro.